final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 15404 in the name of Tavish Scott on broadband and mobile phone coverage in rural and island communities. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate. Please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Tavish Scott to open the debate. Mr Scott, you have seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank members from across Parliament and indeed the Deputy First Minister for their assistance in making this brief debate this evening uh, happen. Um, Shetland, the crime drama, is currently screening on TV on a Friday night, and most of us at home are watching it to see if we're in it, uh, or if any of our friends are extras in it, or just to see whether the, see whether the house is in the background. Um, Dougie Henshaw is often, for those of you who watch it, on his mobile, out in the wilds of the island, not just in Lerwick, but out in the wilds of the island, and that's where this TV series very definitely becomes fiction. Uh, just as I am pleased to say there have been no recent murders in Shetland, nor has mobile phone coverage reached all the islands either. Uh, mobile phone coverage and fast broadband, broadband are linked. Many mobile phone companies see no economic case for improving coverage in Shetland. I know that's the case across large chunks of our country as well, a situation that will worsen as companies merge and competition diminishes. Uh, much of Shetland is, is excluded, for example, from Vodafone's Rural Open Sure Signal project. Why? Because it needs a reliable, if modest, broadband service. Last October, EEE, EE, I should say, was awarded the contract for Airwave, the network used by the emergency services across Scotland and indeed across the UK. This contract could specify 4G across Scotland. That would be better broadband on phones and tablets than people are going to get through superfast super broadband rollout supported by governments, high and British Telecom. So I want to begin this evening, Presiding Officer, by asking the Deputy First Minister to ensure that this new emergency mobile phone system is specified as 4G, not just in Shetland but right across Scotland, because of the benefits that would undoubtedly bring uh, to many, many parts of the country. It is, I know, a UK responsibility, but it, I will very much support Mr Swinney and his government if they're able to make that case uh, as well. I say this because superfast broadband, presiding officer, like certain beer commercials, is not quite reaching the parts it's meant to reach. Uh, last week, indeed, I received a letter from the Deputy First Minister. Uh, he wrote, and I quote, areas as far north as Lerwick in the Shetland Islands and as far south as Gretna in Dumfries and Galloway are now live thanks to the programme. It was a digital Scotland um, communication. Now, as the Deputy First Minister knows, there's more to Shetland than just Lerwick. Shetlanders living in Unst, Walls or North Maven are just plain fed up at having no idea when they will benefit from all the public money rightly being invested in superfast broadband. In the islands, investment needs to be directed at providing high-speed broadband for the hardest to reach customers across the islands, rather than chasing a flat percentage population target. I suspect I'm not the only constituency member who'd like to see that approach. And I wonder tonight if the Deputy First Minister would agree with that and look at how his government is best targeting the resources that are available uh, to him. Uh, a U-Sound resident in Unst told me last week that she is unable to view online learning videos for the fire service. Now, I have a letter, and no doubt many other rural members do as well, from the Chief Fire Master, Alistair Hay, saying that the Fire and Rescue Service are desperate for new retained firefighters. Yet Caroline Hunter up in Unst cannot do her online fire training because the broadband is so woeful. And I thought that rather made the point about the importance of broadband in that sense in providing the emergency services that, dare I say, we all depend on. So, despite receiving a meagre half a megabyte, Caroline and other folk in US Sound are forced to pay the same as those who receive 20 megabytes here, say, in the capital city of Scotland. Scotland. Now, they see that as extremely iniquitous. Uh, I agree, and I hope the Deputy First Minister does too. And perhaps he can say uh, tonight, Presiding Officer, what Ofcom, the, Ofcom, I should say, the regulator, are doing about what seems to many across Scotland, and certainly in Shetland, to be a manifestly unfair situation. An eighth father, rather more, I suppose, pointedly as a, as a parent, said to me that a simple update to his son's games console could exceed the household's monthly broadband data allowance, given what they can currently access. Now, in an age, dare I say it, those of us with children, in an age of multi-device households, multi-device, I don't know how many are in my home, in an age of multi-device households, that just doesn't cut it. So more needs to be done. Numerous constituents believe they will not currently benefit from the 
broadband rollout that's currently envisaged. The North Maven Community Council uh, cannot progress their community project as they are passed, dare I say it, from pillar to post between BT High and Community Broadband Scotland. I asked the Scottish Parliament's library just to confirm how many Community Broadband Scotland projects have been completed and that uh, was uh, something they couldn't quite come back with. Perhaps again it would be helpful if the Deputy First Minister could tell Parliament how uh, that is coming on in his speech this evening. I hope too he would recognise that communities without any plan or date for broadband upgrades deserve not just answers but greater action and clarity from government, from British Telecom and from Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Shetland residents say Digital Scotland's scheduled rollouts for their respective areas online are heroically optimistic. One Stromforth resident told me how his local exchange was listed as coming soon between July and December 2015. Now, those of you observant here this evening will recognise we're now in February 2016, and yes, it hasn't come yet. So uh, the website now helpfully says the broadband is going to come soon between January and June of the year we're now in. Well, people, know, uh, people are uh, understandably frustrated by the uh, expectation of seeing some progress and then not actually ha ha having it happen. High and British Telecom justify not providing a local broadband cabinet in that particular example as it would only provide super fast speeds to a minority. Now I was a bit taken aback by that one because is that not the point? Uh, and I would suggest that why should the few be left behind? The whole point about the investment in superfast broadband was to, with public money, I should add, with public money, was to ensure those areas in all our constituencies and areas that, are currently, that currently cannot achieve it because of, the, because of no market pr provision can be helped by the government investment in that. High are incidentally unable to confirm whether my constituents in that case will receive any coverage in any future phase. Another GOT resident is a photographer. Her download speed is 0.39 of a megabyte. She struggles to send photos via email. High and BT have confirmed that she will not see the benefits of the rollout due to her distance from the existing telephone exchange. I'm sure that's an issue that many colleagues will rec recognise. No fibre cabinet is currently planned or coming soon in that area. So I just... Uh, wish to reiterate a call for further investment in those areas of Shetland and elsewhere in Scotland who have poor or indeed non-existent superfast broadband. I'd ask the Deputy First Minister to explain where and when we'll see improvements to superfast broadband and who will be the 5% left behind because they're the ones who feel it most at this moment. And I hope he would accept that his government, High and BT, must be more transparent with local people about if and when they will really see that improvement. Fast Internet uh, Deputy Presiding Officer is a service that many people take for granted. I very much look forward to the day when we can do the same in Shetland and all the parts of Scotland that currently do not. If the Deputy First Minister can provide my constituents with a route map to achieve that, he will very much have my full support. Many thanks. <coughs> I now call on Mike Russell to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I commend and congratulate Tavish Scott for achieving this debate. Uh, and he is right to stress that communications are absolutely vital for each one of us, digital as well as physical communications. And if you live in rural Scotland, particularly rural and island Scotland, they are essential. And there are some good things to be celebrated tonight. Uh, the rollout of the broadband project is continuing apace and people are getting a service in some places in Scotland. Uh, there is 3G signals via EE, particularly in my constituency, though nothing from Vodafone or O2. And uh, sometimes Vodafone, although I have been very critical of it, does come good. I opened a new Sure signal facility in the village of Ormesry uh, in Kintyre um, on uh, Friday. And the new Sure signal signal, which also operates uh, in Easdale, I'm glad to say, is very positive. But the real problem in expanding the services that are much needed in my constituency and elsewhere lies not with Vodafone or with any of the other mobile companies, it lies with BT. Because BT provide the, essentially the, the, the groundwork, the infrastructure that supports all the rest. And I want to focus, to presiding officer, this evening on that issue. Because it is no exaggeration to say that my constituents and many constituents in Scotland have a major problem with BT. In the last uh, 12 weeks, I have opened 39 new constituency cases complaining about BT, and they are only the tip of the iceberg. Indeed, I have become so concerned that some weeks ago I emailed Brendan Dick, the uh, head of BT in Scotland, and I said to him I thought there was a crisis in his organisation. And I say that again today here. 
There is a crisis in BT in Scotland and how it delivers. It is an organisation that is not listening to its customers, it is not listening to rural Scotland, and it is not listening to the most vulnerable in our society. And I want to start with that, Presiding Officer, with the case of Mrs Ackroyd in Loch Don on the island of Mull. She's 79, she lost her husband a few months ago. Seven weeks today, she lost her landline. Every day, somebody has called BT with that problem. Nine times out of ten, she's promised a callback, and it never comes. And her mobile signal is very patchy in Loch Don. She is even given, as often happens in these cases, specific times and dates for visits by engineers, and they pass by with no contact whatsoever. More worryingly still, as happens right across Scotland, her alarm pendant is dependent upon her landline. She's still paying for that, she's still relying on it, but it has not worked since the 22nd of December. Now, her local councillor, Mary Jean Devon, contacted me yesterday and said that she'd watched this lady, this confident lady, begin to lose confidence because she was so worried about the lack of service. Now, BT is letting that lady down. And I could go through a list of other people in my constituency whom they have let down. In the village of Bridge of Orkey, uh, which suffered some damage just before Christmas, I had three vulnerable constituents who not only didn't get their service restored quickly enough, but again got constant promises that were not fulfilled. Toward School, and I declare an interest to uh, presiding officers, the school where my wife is a head teacher, has gone for three weeks without an adequate landline service. And that is essential for a small rural primary school. And the staff have been having to use their mobile phones and using up their allowances in order to make uh, uh, amends. And in the island of Easdale, I know uh, Mr Mackenzie knows it well, they have constant problems, both with landlines and with uh, broadband. And the same is true right across our Island Butte. And it is not being treated seriously. It is a problem for individuals and it's also a problem for built businesses. On the island of Mull, again, Duart Castle, one of the main uh, tourist attractions, has had four lines out again for seven weeks and no action. And indeed, I was uh, in Kintyre on uh, Friday, looking at the two wind farms that have been established by the community with the Lithgows, and they have pled with British Telecom to get the service they need to run those wind farms, and it took them almost a year to get anything approaching adequate, and £40,000. So there is a crisis in delivery, and even where broadband is delivered, I have constituents who pay the full price for, for super-fast broadband. But because they're connected to fibre by copper, they are not getting anything like the speeds they have been promised and indeed contracted for. So there is damage being done by the failure of British Telecom. And I have to put it as bluntly as that. I think that the super-fast broadband programme is fantastic. I've supported it in government. I support it now. It's going to make and is making a huge difference in the Highlands and Islands. But it is being let down and the prospect for change is being let down by British Telecom. So can I just say this to the Cabinet Secretary, to the Deputy First Minister. He's a man of great charm, but also of great persuasion. Next time he has uh, Brendan Dick in to see him, perhaps he could say to him that the eminently reasonable friend he has here on the back benches is getting a little fed up. Indeed, my constituents like me just can't take this anymore from BT. And I hope he will persuade him to get the, his organisation into a shape that can deliver not just for people now, but deliver for those who rely on building and developing those services for the future. That is essential. It must happen. And Brendan Dick must listen. Many thanks. I now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to congratulate Tavish Scott for securing the debate. This is a really important issue for Shetland and indeed the whole of the Highlands and Islands. I remember in the first parliament my colleague Maureen McMillan starting to campaign for access to broadband, realising the implications it had for our communities. Peter Peacock took that campaign over when she stood down and I was happy to pick up the cudgels when he retired. Our MPs in Westminster recently compared their constituents' download speeds. The Western Isles was worst, with Ross Sky and Loch Aber at 647th out of 650 and Caithness and Sutherland and Easter Ross um, at 640th. Add to that the statistics in Tavish Scott's motion and we see that the Highlands and Islands are extremely poorly served. 
The Scottish Government's 95 per cent target by 2017 does nothing to address this because they only need to target urban areas to reach it. To make the target meaningful, it needs to be across much smaller units of population, even smaller than council areas, which tend to have urban and rural populations as well. The Highlands and Islands Broadband Project has made a real difference and it will make a real difference. Without it, many more would be out of reach of next generation broadband. And it will provide the backhaul that's required for mobile phone operators as well. But that doesn't mean that we simply say thank you and leave it at that. We still need to fight to get 100% coverage because those from furthest from the connection have most to gain. They're often the most disadvantaged as it stands. Access to next generation broadband would redress some of the disadvantage. And the same is true of mobile coverage. Uh, 2, 3 and 4G also has the ability to work over terrains um, where laying fibre is difficult. We must look at mass sharing and at roaming to give the best coverage to all mobile data users. We need to look at all technologies and utilise them to ensure 100% coverage. Access to next generation broadband is not a luxury anymore, it's essential. You needed to submit your CAP form, um, that's if they ever sort, sort out the claim system. You need to apply it for needed to apply for benefits and remote communities have the most to gain from access uh, to telehealth and telecare. Um, and I recognise what um, Mike Russell was saying about help call. I also had a constituent who had a help call button but was cut off from their phone line. And I've spoken to BT about this and raised the issue about them having a vulnerable persons register where people with help calls will be registered and given priority to have their phone lines reconnected if there's a problem. I understand they're looking at this, but other organisations such as um, Shettle have that ability when there's power cuts and make sure that the vulnerable customers are reconnected fastest. So I believe BT should have the same. Presiding officer, I've got businesses in my region that are looking to relocate because of their poor broadband connection. And that's simply wrong. Their companies who value their communities and who want to remain there. And they are, in effect, being forced out. The government has set up Community Broadband Scotland to help provide last mile solutions, but they only provide funding and advice. And for those to qualify for help under Community Broadband Scotland, they need to know that they will not get uh, next generation broadband in the rollout. Um, and we don't know who all will be covered. We need a definitive uh, map of where and where will not have coverage so people can decide what they need to do for their own coverage in the future. Those communities working with Community Broadband Scotland also need to bring forward the solutions themselves. They need to be able to organise themselves into community companies. And this doesn't happen um, everywhere because not all communities have the capacity to do this. And that's often the case for communities that are much closer to urban areas. They're not so self-sufficient because they depend on the urban areas for services. But regardless, we need to look at how we deal with this. We need to set up co-ops or social enterprises that will reach out to those communities and provide the services for them that they desperately need. The government needs to take a lead and drive this forward. They have to ensure that there's no not spots, either for broadband or mobile coverage in Scotland. Many thanks. I now call on Mike McKenzie to be followed by Alex Johnson. Four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I, was, I was kind of uh, thinking during Mr Russell's speech that he's almost an easy deal more than I am these days, such as the, 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 the effort he puts into representing Argyll and Butte. I'm often off on other islands in Orkney and I'm very much looking forward to going to Shetland this weekend and um, experience again what uh, Mr Scott's been talking about. But and looking back over my whole adult life as an islander, I can think of nothing that has transformed the experience of island life more than the coming of the internet. I received the very first email ever to arrive on my home island of Easdale in 1992, and somehow I knew back then that this was the start of something significant, and I printed a copy out and gave it to a local museum. But I, I little knew back then just how much it would transform our lives, connecting us with the rest of the world and providing access to knowledge and information which had hitherto been greatly restricted. And almost at a stroke, we were transformed from a backwater and granted fully-fledged membership to the community of Scotland 
and to the rest of the world. And I can think of nothing either which has contributed more to reducing the, the regional inequality that islanders have historically suffered from than the internet. A little knew back then that in taking the first steps in accessing this miraculous technology that we were at the start of what was to become a race to stay connected at the same rate and the same level as the rest of the world. The innovation and the progress of information technologies has been astounding. The range and quality of services increasingly consumed online is staggering. And even so, I think we've barely scratched the surface. Participating in the modern economy demands good internet access, both fixed and mobile. And developments, very promising developments like telehealth and telemedicine, um, fuel poverty initiatives like smart metering and innovations like smart houses all require good internet access but can transform our lives and transform public services, making them far more effective and efficient than, than we're capable of doing at the moment. And to do that will require good internet access well beyond that which we experience across the islands today. And the irony has been that we're actually losing this race. Increasing usage and demand means that what was perfectly adequate connectivity a very few years ago is now hopelessly inadequate in both mobile and fixed line services. And this is the result of both market and regulatory failure, delivering when coverage is available, coverage that's still very patchy across the Highlands and Islands. And that's why I was absolutely delighted at the £127 million investment the Scottish Government is making across the Highlands and Islands to provide that all-important fibre optic backbone for high-speed high -speed broadband as the necessary first step in catching up and staying abreast of the rest of the world in that race. And I'm delighted also that Community Broadband Scotland is committed to addressing those areas where fibre optic cables won't reach. Progress, of course, has been slower than hoped for, and I'm very, very well aware, though, of the technological challenges and the sheer physical challenges involved operating such a hostile terrain in a hostile climate. But I'm optimistic, very optimistic, that we will see a sea change and improvement fairly soon. And I'm pleased, to be fair, to note that the UK government is working on a universal so service obligation for 10 megabits per second. And I note that they promised 95% coverage by the end of 2017, but that's not good enough for our islands because inevitably our islands will always be in that 5% that are left behind. Um, the sleeping giant of Ofcom has, beginning, has begun to awake, but it's not fully awake yet. Um, and ultimately, I believe the best way to deal with this is to provide proper and effective regulation rather than governments Mr. paying George, out to address please. the market failure. And I know really that the, the regulatory powers still reside with Westminster. I'm quite sure if they were here in this parliament, we could address the issue properly. Many thanks. Um, due to the number of members who would like to speak in this debate, I'm minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend business beyond the normal time. Mr Scott, would you like to move such a motion? So moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. So the question is, will we extend beyond the normal time? Are we all agreed? We are. Many thanks. And so I now call on Alex Johnson to be followed by Kenny Gibson. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. The challenge of providing uh, high-quality mobile phone and broadband services in a country like Scotland uh, is not one that should be underestimated. The geography of the country uh, is one that will always uh, bring about difficulties. And yet, if we look around the world, we find that these difficulties have been overcome effectively in other countries. Uh, my own experience in the Alpine nations is that there tends to be a much higher quality of mobile phone signal and better performance uh, even among the highest of mountains and on the top of these mountains. 
Indeed, I have been told by the BBC, so it must be true, that it is now possible to get a 4G signal on the summit of Mount Everest. If that can be achieved, then what can we achieve here in Scotland? The fact is that the basic service, uh, mobile service that is available uh, over most of Scotland is indeed a very basic one indeed. Personal experience indicates that there are difficulties even in the areas where there should not be. Uh, my own hometown has a Vodafone signal that uh, is most basic uh, at its best and on two occasions in the last year has been down for three weeks at a time. Uh, something which may be an advantage to an MSP who looks for a bit of peace at the weekends, but I can assure you something that is far less convenient for the doctor who regularly phones me to tell me that his signal has gone. As a result of that, it becomes clear that our problems are not simply on the most extreme peripheries of Scotland. They do exist in some form across the whole of the country. In fact, when we come to the issue of broadband, uh, the Deputy First Minister will not be unaware that I have complained to him many times about the quality of my broadband service. And this is in a town where, uh, a number of years ago, uh, high-speed broadband arrived, or super-fast broadband arrived, in a blaze of publicity. Only we were to be told that those of us who were connected directly to the exchange could not have it because we were not connected through a cabinet. This is a, a problem that I have spoken to, to a number of people uh, and I have never received an adequate answer as to why this can't be dealt with quickly and efficiently and why it hasn't been dealt with yet. We have many challenges that face us, but we have a system in place that is beginning to address these challenges. The problem is, I believe, that the challenge is so great and the resources that are being mobilised in order to overcome the difficulties are so great that we have some confusion over what uh, needs to happen and when it will happen. Therefore, I think it would be of great service for those who are aware of what has to happen if they could be told when the changes are likely to take place. Communication is vital. Whether it's about communicating the times or schedules for the upgrades or whether it's simply communicating directly with the sad constituents in that Mike Russell has talked about during this debate. It's much easier to accept that we all have to wait for these good things if we know that someone is working on it and that there is a time when these services will be available. Sadly, that's not always the case. Returning finally to the issue of rural mobile phone signals, it has to be made clear, as I am sure we all understand, and the, first, the Deputy First Minister himself, coming from rural Perthshire, will know this only too clearly, that we have now lost most of our phone boxes in rural areas. And the mobile phone system itself is now a vital part of the safety system that we have in place in these areas. When accidents happen in remote rural areas or when medical attention is required at short notice, it is now the case that often the mobile phone is the only way to deal with that. Sadly, we do not have the universal coverage that we need. We need to look at all the options that are available to ensure that we can provide that coverage even in the most remote areas. Scotland deserves it. The work is being done but we're not achieving results as quickly as we should. Draw to a close, please. I ther therefore ask the Minister to consider how we can make the resources available work more effectively for the people right across Scotland. Many thanks. Now call on Kenny Gibson to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Presiding officer, I would like to thank Tavi Scott for lodging his motion and enabling us to discuss this very important issue uh, this evening. And of course, the Deputy First Minister does know about this issue because on 18th of January, uh, if he didn't know already, the Finance Committee met in Pitlochry in his constituency, and one of the big issues that was raised was the issue of um, lack of rural broadband in Highland Perthshire. Uh, and I know that the Deputy First Minister took away that information uh, that day. In my own constituency of Cunningham North, uh, we have the island of Arran and the island of Cumbria, as well as rural areas mm -hmm. with houses scattered few and far between in mainland North Ayrshire. I'm therefore acutely aware of the need for reliable and affordable rural broadband and mobile phone coverage. These days, there is an expectation bordering on an assumption 
that everyone is able or should be able to access information online, complete a web form, email something through, etc. The minority who do not have access are therefore at a considerable disadvantage. And this is not only frustrating for individuals, we need to make rural and island communities more competitive and appealing as places to live, work and do business. In July 2015, Deloitte published a report commissioned by the Scottish Futures Trust exploring three scenarios for digitalisation in Scotland over the next few years. It concluded that if Scotland becomes a world leader in digitalisation, it could see an increase in gross domestic product of over £13 billion by 2030. Even in the least optimistic scenario, this increase would be £4 billion. The report furthermore describes countless positive impacts of increased digitalisation on GDP per capita, employability, tax revenues, the environment and healthcare, and I would encourage anyone who is interested in the wider benefits of digitalisation to have a look at it. In March of last year, the Deputy First Minister wrote to the UK Government to implement a universal service obligation, or asking them to implement a universal service obligation for broadband services to ensure access to affordable high-speed broadband for all in Scotland. In November, the Prime Minister announced that such an obligation would indeed be put in place. And although his planned obligation to provide every household with 10 uh, uh, Mbps broadband connection by May 2020 is less progressive than up to 80 Mbps aimed for, aimed for in a digital rollout, I do believe it is a step in the right direction. The Scottish Government and partners have, of course, invested £410 million through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, and I welcome the recently announced further investment by the Scottish Government of more than £130 million for Scotland's digital strategy, mostly supporting infrastructure to help towards the target of 95 per cent of premises having access to next-generation broadband by March 2018, which Tavis Scott, of course, mentioned in his opening speech. It is encouraging that the 85 per cent target for March 2016 has already been surpassed, but it is crucial to keep up the pace. And my constituents on Aaron regularly report concerns over the reliability of their connections, much in the way that Mike Russell's constituents express concerns. However, over 1,400 premises in parts of Brodick, Lamlash, Shisker and Whiting Bay and Arne now benefit from the new fibre optic network, and further coverage and rollout on Arne is scheduled to take place this spring and summer. Originally, coverage would take place on 97 per cent of the island, uh, with an area around Macri omitted for topographical reasons. And I continue to urge BT, which is delivering the arm rollout, to explore every option to ensure that Macri will benefit from the network. Uh, properties in Macri are connected via so-called exchange-only lines directly to the exchange that ran through a green roadside cabinet, which makes it more difficult to bring fibre to the properties served by these lines. However, it has been done before, as we have already heard, and understand it should hopefully happen in Macri by the end of this year. Another problem area in my constituency is the small community of Burnhouse on the mainland. Here the challenge is its remoteness from the exchange that means residents are not yet able to access fibre broadband. Solutions are currently being explored to get Burnhouse upgraded, but this takes time residents simply do not feel they have. Presiding officer, I cannot stress enough how important it is that rural and island commun uh, communities have access to reliable fast broadband and mobile phone coverage. Significant progress is being made, but I will continue to press for all areas of my constituency to benefit from the digital bro broadband programme. Those living in rural and island communities should not have to feel like they are running behind the rest of Scotland, and we must ensure they have no reason to. Many thanks. Now I call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. And can I, uh, like others, uh, congratulate my colleague Tavis Scott on giving us an opportunity to debate this issue uh, this evening? I think the picture described by Tavis Scott very much reflects the picture uh, in my own Orkney constituency. If you replace uh, Unst, Walls and North Ma Maven with Bursey, Rousey and North Ronaldsey, I think the picture is very much uh, the same. Like Mike Russell, uh, I think poor broadband and, and mobile coverage generates a, a large proportion of my mailbag uh, on a weekly and monthly basis. Um, but I think, rightly, um, the, the government, UK government, Scottish government and its partners deserve credit for the investment that is being made in terms of the superfast broadband rollout. Uh, however, the figures do suggest that uh, at the end of this process, 75 per cent of premises in my own Orkney constituency will be covered, compared to an 84 per cent uh, picture uh, Highlands and Islands wide and a 95 per cent picture uh, nationwide across Scotland. And I think perhaps there's a, there, there are reasons behind that, but I would hope the Deputy First Minister would accept that um, the, the priority for any future investment needs to be on those areas that continue to lag so far behind the national and regional averages. Because the digital divide that's 
opened up between rural and urban Scotland is now being reflected in a digital divide opening up within rural communities. And that's a source of, of real concern. I, I listened to Mike Russell's um, uh, concerns in relation to BT, and I have some sympathy with them, although I think I would want to put on record um, my gratitude to the efforts of many of the open reach uh, engineers, some of whom I saw labouring away in ditches in a rain-soaked North Ronaldsey. I can't really at the moment, North Ronaldsey, trying to address problems caused by lightning strikes on that, uh, on that uh, uh, island. But I think the points made by, by Mike Russell in terms of the, the approach to the company in relation to customer services are well made. The picture in terms of mobile coverage is very similar uh, too. But let me illustrate uh, these points in two ways. Both are looking at the economic development impacts, but also in terms of service delivery. On economic development, I was struck by the extent to which the tourism sector is having to adapt to the digital age. At a recent uh, conference organised by the Orkney Tourism Group uh, on this very issue, it was reflected that some still come to Orkney in order to escape the digital age, but um, by and large, expectations are changing. Holidaymakers, whether it's researching the destinations and the activities online, uh, to looking for recommendations, and to bookings and interacting with businesses ahead of arrival. Once there, they're looking to capture and um, sharing their experience and images with friends, families, and others who may be interested. And it's not just about Wi-Fi in your room or your self-catering cottage or in your visitor destination. It's about access to reliable mobile coverage on the move. If this seems slightly uh, frivolous, how about the effect on health service delivery. There was a report in 2012 by Dr Andrew Ingalls as a consultant working for the emergency retrieval team uh, out of Glasgow, and he concluded that poor network coverage um, in rural areas results in an impaired service for patients and increased NHS costs. He quoted a BMG report suggesting that rural practitioners need to provide emergency case, care, and in some remote areas, they may have to manage critically sick or injured patients for a number of hours before these patients can be transferred. And this certainly reflects the experience of Bernie Holbrook, the nurse practitioner in North Ronsey, whom I met yesterday. Uh, during our discussions about um, air ambulance service provision, the issue of mobile coverage kept coming up. Uh, it was pointed out that this can and help improve uh, response times. It allows initial assessment and information to be uh, passed on ahead of the patient arriving uh, at hospital. Uh, it can provide support to community responders or those first on the scene who may uh, be lacking in the experience and knowledge but can be guided through this. Uh, more routinely, uh, it allows more successful management of patients with chronic conditions. It can avoid unnecessary and arduous trips away from, in this case, North Ronsey or even from Orkney itself and thereby helps improve patient care while also reducing costs. So these are just some of the advantages um, that high quality broadband and mobile coverage can now provide and show why it is uh, absolutely essential to communities in Orkney. Uh, and they cannot afford to continue to languish at the back of the queue. So can I thank Tavis Scott again uh, for allowing Parliament to shine a light on this issue. And I very much look forward uh, to the Deputy First Minister's response. I'm self familiar with many of the circumstances in Orkney. Thank you very much indeed. Many thanks. I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Jean at Four minutes, please. Uh, Presiding Officer, it is an absolutely immense privilege to be elected, each and every one of us, uh, as an MSP here. In my case, the particular privilege which touches on the issue tonight is when I come to the Scottish Parliament, my broadband speed leaps by a factor of 800. Um, the, the speed over the last 10 days at home, the median speed is 0.2 of a megabyte. On Sunday, booking my railway ticket to journey to Parliament took 40 minutes. Um, not terribly good. But my constituents equally are in a similar position. The Digital Scotland uh, website tells us that exchange-only lines, and references have already been made to that, uh, are more prevalent in Aberdeenshire Mr. Johnson should note, and in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, just because of the history of the way the telephone network was, uh, was installed. But don't let's imagine it's just actually rural areas. Just before coming here, I was speaking to someone who is in Cumley Bank in Edinburgh, right in the centre. They're on an exchange-only line as well. So right across Scotland, the issue of exchange-only lines is a significant issue that is denying people the ability to have access to services uh, in, in the way that the majority have. Now, there's actually an economic value in ubiquity. On the day that everybody in Scotland is connected to a high-speed broadband connection, 
we can shut down all the methods of communication uh, that require that, that have to continue to support low bandwidth connections. Then we can save money centrally. Now, of course, I've, I've got a solution to all of this. It's not a technological solution. It's a very simple and straightforward solution. It's a policy solution. The Scottish Government must install devices on their own internet net connections that restrict the speed of those connections to that prevailing in rural Aberdeenshire, rural Shetland, rural Orkney, rural Western Isles, and Fries and Galloway. Do you know, I think if we did that, we would suddenly get things so, and rural Argyll as well, I hear Mr. Russell pleading. I, said, I, have a, I just have this vague feeling we might uh, actually get things fixed. In fact, I will, I will say to you, last year we had a very pleasant uh, holiday in Ports in uh, Plopton, where we'd rented a cottage. I didn't want to come home. It was running at six megabits. 20 times what it had been running at home uh, in, in Bamsha uh, when, 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 when I left. Um, my wife and my dentist are the greatest uh, proponents uh, of our getting proper access to high-speed broadband, mainly because my wife doesn't like the sound of my chewing the edge of my desk in frustration, and while you can work out my dentist's concern uh, for, for my teeth. So, uh, presiding officer, of course, it isn't just broadband. Where I live, there's no mobile phone signal, 2G, 1G, 3G, whatever the prevailing stuff is. Uh, there is no free view access. I, I can't even get satellite broadband because the satellites, there are two of them, are not due south. So the angle of attack is 20.5 degrees or 22. And the terrain stops me seeing them as well. And I'm not alone. On that side of the hill, we can't get satellite either. And not that it's as good as getting proper fibre broadband. I finally close, presiding officer, by pointing out I have actually costed the cost of wholesale purchase of the fibre that's necessary to connect my house to the exchange, which is not that far away, and it's 300 quid. Well, I've got the 300 quid waiting, presiding officer. Many thanks. Now I call on Jean Arcott to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, presiding officer, and I too congratulate Tavi Scott in bringing this timely debate to the chamber tonight. And. Uh, like others have mentioned, welcome the investment made by the Scottish Government uh, to address the issue of delivering broadband to rural and island communities that I represent. Um, having said that, it seems that even in the, the five years, or almost five years of being in this Parliament, expectations have changed and working practices have changed. Small businesses have changed and a great deal has changed across the highlands and islands. And there was a time when broadband was seen perhaps as a luxury or and super fast broadband as even more of a luxury. But now it's seen as a necessity of life, just like water or a roof over your head. Anyone contemplating running a small business in the rural areas that I represent, or even the more urban parts of the Highlands and Islands, the towns, simply won't contemplate it without uh, super fast broadband or broadband. And the mobile signal is, as has been mentioned already, clearly uh, essential. I would also endorse uh, Tavish Scott's request in trying to establish how the, the success, the examples of successful community, <coughs> excuse me, community broadband Scotland projects. <coughs> If you look on the BT website, sorry, <coughs> there is a map showing uh, the work and we've possibly all arranged to have BT make presentations in communities, which they've done. But the gaps are often uh, referred to, uh, hopefully that Community Broadband Scotland might actually be able to plug these gaps but how that's working is not clear. And often we leave uh, community groups with uh, uh, the contact address of Community Broadband Scotland and hear, thank you very much, uh, little about the progress that's been made thereafter. 
this summer, I have to say that I, I spent uh, most of recess on the islands um, meeting with social enterprises, community groups, community associations, and it was the hot topic in each and every single case. Last weekend in Elfin, I was invited to go and meet a group of people there who couldn't understand that the, wood, the fibre cables would run through their community, but not for their community. So I, I, I do see that it is actually the hot topic and, and does need to be addressed by all of us. But if we want to see the fairer Scotland, then I think that it must be a priority for everyone. But it's not only for business and it's not only uh, for fun. I think more often than not now we're encouraged to fill in whether it's the DWP or licenses or paying license or crofters having to complete forms online. And they're, and they're the very people often who have no access to that. So it is essential that we start to see, uh, I think, more importance given to the, the gaps, the 20% the or the 25% that, that uh, Liam MacArthur mentioned in Orkney and elsewhere, that these gaps are plugged. But it's more than that, presiding officer. I think there's a real issue of, of democracy and this parliament, and this is something that I have uh, talked about before, we now have in the cross-party group on crofting in uh, one of the rooms here at Q102, the ability to hold our cross-party group live online, as it were. People can dial in or come in on the internet. And that's great from here, but we need to be able to, that, that group of, of, of uh, cross-party group on crofting doesn't attract crofters from central Edinburgh nor does it attract them from central Glasgow. It's of interest to people who are in rural areas who would like to access the discussion that's happening in Parliament. So if we want to see democracy, real democracy, working across the country, and if we believe what we say, that we want people to be accessing this Parliament and its work, then all of this is relevant to that too. Thank you. Thanks so much. I now call on Bruce Colford, after which we'll move to closing speech from the Deputy First Minister. First of all, as is the normal practice, congratulate Tavish Scott for bringing this debate to the Chamber. The fact that there are so many people here taking part in the debate tonight, I think, shows its real worth. So thank you, Tavish Scott, for doing that. You know, we're not, would it not be great that if we were here, here this evening talking about what a, an exciting, fantastic, connected country that Scotland was and how our, we were leading the world in terms of our broadband and our mobile coverage. Our tourism business is able to put out online the excitement and dramatic value of the beauty that they represent. Our farmers able to bid for the beasts that they see in the, the market online. Our kids able to involve themselves in educational tools that help with social inclusion um, and health, te health, telehealth, getting access to information in a way that we can't at the moment. And where people are living in remote, rural and remote areas, overcoming some of the difficulties that are faced over transport by having just great connectivity. That would be the, the vision that we should always share. And I think the opportunities for our, us as a nation are utterly boundless if we can get this right. And I'm hugely excited by the potential. And because of that, I'm delighted with the extra money being put in by the Scottish Government and the UK Government to try to get us to where we need to be. I'm engaged with communities the length and breadth of my constituency, every nook and cranny, from Tyndrum to Mugduck, from Fillin and Cowie to the shores of the east of Loch Lomond. And there are, in many areas, it's working fantastically well, but there are not spots, as described in Tavi Scott's um, motion well, that exist also across my constituency. So I want to thank, though, at this stage, Digital, Digital Scotland, and for their sheer level of engagement with me, particularly through Duncan Nisbet, I think if you ask Duncan, he'll tell you he's been more engaged with my constituency than any other constituency in the country, um, because I'm never off the phone to the man. And I know he's got a reception here this evening um, that Stuart Stevenson's uh, hosting. He's doing a, a great job, but frankly, he's doing it in two men and a dog, and he probably needs a bit more support to be able to, for him to be able to go out and do that. Likewise, Sean Marley um, from Community Broadband Scotland has been engaged with me with these communities all over the place as we look for new bespoke solutions for every community 
that finds itself in a not spot. And that's one of the, the problems with all of this. The communities are coming. Some fantastic people in some, with, and uh, as Rhoda Grant said, some communities needing a bit more capacity, but with some fantastic people coming up with some great solutions, particularly around the wireless network and how that can be used. Um, but we need to be able to think of the long term and how sustainable that model is for all these communities working in a different way. So that's why I was pleased that recently the Community Broadband Advisory Group and Stirling Council agreed to carry out an audit of the not spots across the Stirling area so that it can get the communities to work together to find the solutions that help them. So all of that's good. There, there are some things, you know, and it's all fantastic activity going on across some great um, communities. But you know, this could be sorted so much more quickly. Universal service obligation should have been there. We shouldn't be waiting till now to have that universal service obligation. In Spain and in Finland, it exists. And if we had the right to get access to the telephone in the past, to be able to pick up the telephone and use it, why do not people in this modern day and age have the right to have fast access to broadband speeds? There's a structural problem that exists. I heard Mike's um, having a walloping at BT. I understand that. But they've got a structural problem that exists there because of the Chinese wall that exists between Ofcom on one side and on the other side, a BT main company. And the two are not allowed to talk to each other. It's ridiculous what's been put in place by way of a structure across the UK. There are many technical aspects that I could go into this evening, President Officer, but I know you're shaking your head at me and we don't have enough time to do that. Um, so, the, so the last thing I just want to go back to, I made the point already, is the fact of, of all the great work that's going on across my communities, the length and breadth, working hard in their own steam to try to make this work. And talking of steam, I just wish we were no longer having a, a network uh, um, involved in connectivity that actually comes from the steam age and we could get ourselves into the modern age. Hey, thanks. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary, John Swinney, uh, to close the debate on behalf of the Government, Mr Swinney. Uh, President Officer, can I begin by thanking Thomas Scott for uh, putting down this motion and for uh, promoting this debate tonight. And I want to take the opportunity of this debate to reassure members that I understand entirely the significance of this issue and its importance to all communities of Scotland, but particularly the rural and island communities that are the focus of Mr Scott's motion tonight. I know that not just because of my experience in representing Perthshire, Perth City and the rural parts of northern Perthshire into the bargain, but also by the fact that this issue is by far the largest issue upon which I correspond with members of the Scottish Parliament. And some of the usual suspects are here tonight, uh, who occupy significant parts in my mailbag. And, uh, and I, I understand and recognise the significance of the issues. Why? Because as a society, we are now living our lives in many respects with broadband as an essential service in the way in which we undertake all of our transactions and our activities. At a recent meeting of the Convention of the Highlands and Islands, the convener of Western Isles Council made the point that he viewed the significance of the rollout of broadband to the homes and the communities of the Western Isles as significantly as he viewed the rollout of mains electricity in the 1950s to these communities. And I think that rather puts it into perspective as to the significance. So I want to reassure members tonight of the importance the government attach, attaches to this issue, which is why the government has um, participated with the United Kingdom government in funding a £410 million investment programme for the rollout of the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband programme. And why does that matter? Well, that matters because in relation to some of the members that are here tonight, if the government had not done this, in Mr MacArthur's constituency, instead of there being 75% of properties able to have access to superfast broadband, it would have been zero. In Mr Scott's constituency, it would likewise have been zero. In Mr Crawford's constituency, 57.5% would have had access to broadband, uh, unlike the 93.4% that we anticipate under the Superfast Broadband Programme. And for completeness in my own con uh, c community, 
um, it would have been 40.2% instead of the 90% that is scheduled to be. I'll give away to Mr MacArthur. Hey, MacArthur. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking an in intervention, and I think he's, he's entirely justified in pointing out where this market failure needed to be addressed by uh, public investment. But would he accept that, given where we are, and, and a backbone has had to be constructed in order to build out, that actually the priority from here on in is to, is to make up um, the, the ground in those areas which continue to fall below that regional or national average? Well, I, Mr. Mr. MacArthur makes a very fair point, and um, I'm confident that the rollout of superfast broadband will reach the targets that have been set. The 85% coverage target, which was set for March 2016, was, re was reached six months ahead of schedule. So I've got confidence in the rollout of the programme, and I pay tribute to Highlands Lands Enterprise, who have led on this programme, and to the rollout which has been done in partnership with BT. But it is vital that members in the representing constituencies understand the significance the government attaches and the priority we attach to making sure that we complete this process for everybody in Scotland, not just those who will be covered by the programme that we have already commissioned. And my focus is on finding the solutions and using the resources that we have available to us to try to ensure that we can maximise coverage. Now, already in the main programme that the government is taking forward, we have generated a gain share return of around £18 million. That means £18 million of extra capacity beyond the existing plan is available to reach out to further properties. And we have a phase two of the Superfast Broadband programme, which is valued at £42 million, which will also be added to ro the ro rolling out of this programme. Mr Scott asked me about the extent of the involvement of Community Broadband Scotland, which is a crucial in intervention to try to deliver projects that will not be um, at, serviced by the BT contract that the Government has commissioned. Um, Community Broadband Scotland has approved funding for 62 projects so far and is actively supporting a further 90 projects, comprising more than 19,000 premises across Scotland. So I think Community Broadband Scotland has now gained momentum and is now in a position where it's delivering real impact in localities. Um, I'm satisfied that the resources that are available to Community Broadband Scotland are adequate to meet the demand that is currently being expressed. But I give Parliament the reassurance that if I feel that there is more demand than we have the resources currently allocated, I will attach priority to finding new resources to add to those to make sure that we are able to roll out um, broadband to a broader range of communities than currently envisaged under this process. Let me say a few words about mobile coverage because I understand the significance that um, is attached to that with members. Um, this is an area where the Scottish Government has no regu regulatory responsibilities whatsoever. But I have convened discussions with the, four, the currently four mobile network operators on a number of occasions to encourage a partnership approach where the Government is looking at planning regulations, we are looking at business rates issues, local authorities we are encouraging to look at planning issues to try to break down some of the obstacles that might exist in expanding capacity. And I reassure Mr Scott that the, in the negotiation of the UK-wide emergency services mobile communications programme, we are pressing for that to provide the added value of additional 4G connectivity as a consequence of the, uh, the financial contribution we will make to that programme, which obviously will be um, mirrored by the United Kingdom government into the bargain. Let me close, Presiding Officer, with two final points in relation to the debate tonight. Mr Russell, in his characteristically understated fashion, um, has been severely critical of BT. Uh, I'll see BT on Thursday. I'll make the point that Mr Russell has made to me, and I'm sure BT will have heard the points that he has made. I invited BT to come to the Convention of the Highlands and Islands in Elgin um, a few months ago in order that the leaders of the public sector in the Highlands and Islands could have the opportunity, along with the mobile network operators as well, to make their point very directly so that it was clearly understood by these organisations the importance we attach to digital connectivity. And I will make that point, and I repeatedly make that point to uh, BT, of the importance that has to be attached towards effective service, although I think Mr Russell's comments went beyond that into some of the active service that members of the public will experience. 
And lastly, on Ofcom, uh, the Smith Commission, of which Mr Scott and I were both members, recommended that the... Um, well, all I could get past the Smith Commission was for us to have more say in it. I can't remember if Mr Scott was an ally of mine on that particular issue. I'm sure he was an ally. He was always, he was always an ally in the Smith Commission. Um, but the... The point, the furthest we could get the Smith Commission to go to was to say that the, the Ofcom had to have um, a more direct relationship with the Scottish Government and we should nominate a member to the Board of Ofcom. I want to place on record my appreciation to the Chief Executive and the, uh, of Ofcom, Sharon White, who has made extraordinary efforts to strengthen the dialogue with the Scottish Government. Indeed, just last week, uh, I met with Sharon White and also with Barnes Noakes, one of the board members of Ofcom, for a, one of a number of discussions. I also met the chair of Ofcom um, within the last few months to set out the importance the government and parliament attaches to improving connectivity. And I have every confidence that Ofcom have heard that message and are pursuing that message in terms of the exercise of their responsibilities, one of which will be to consider the issues in connection with the universal service obligation. So I, I, I hope what I've said tonight to Parliament um, does justice to the importance of the issues that have been raised by members and by Mr Scott in his motion. Uh, I welcome the fact that members have been appreciative of the investment we have made and the success of the programme to date, but I want to make it absolutely clear to members the centrality that the government attaches to resolving these issues to ensure that every citizen of our country, whether for business, leisure or uh, professional purposes is able to access digital connectivity in their homes and in their localities and to ensure they are well connected to the modern world. Many thanks and I now close this meeting of Parliament.